Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel, and thanks for logging on. If you enjoy these videos, do me a favor and subscribe, because Versus starts now. Today, we are discussing Grand Seiko versus Omega in a battle of automatic all-arounders in rose gold. It's the Grand Seiko Spring Drive SBGA 384 USA Kira Zuri Dial Limited Edition versus the Omega Seamaster Aquaterra 150 meter rose gold watches in universal sizes with automatic calibers and considerable mechanical refinement. We're going to start with the Challenger and the newer of the two watches in the test. Now the Kira Zuri series is based on a Japanese painting aesthetic that translates loosely to shiny painting, and truly that's what you can see on this dial. It's almost like a galvanized metallic pattern, and you can see there are many individual inflections and tonal shifts across this metallic dial. It's not the dial necessarily that defines the watch, though, because it is a cohesive package, the case, the movement, and the dial equally compelling portions of the total proposition. Now, the watch is easy to wear. 40 millimeters in diameter, it's reasonably slim at 12.9. It actually snuck up on me. I thought it would be the thicker of the two watches. It's actually the thinner. And the watch is compact lug to lug and only 46 millimeters lug to lug. So you're going to find that this is an easy watch to wear, even on a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. It's also a scarce piece as three USA limited editions were launched for 2018, this one, a series of 50, you're unlikely to ever see two of them in the same place. So the one on your wrist may be the only one you ever encounter. The watch, well, what can I say about it? It's a handsome piece, nicely executed with a large scale rectangular alligator leather strap, buttery smooth, medium brown, a folded edge and a monotone stitch on the underside. You can see that it does feature a strap made in Japan and almost everything on this watch is made in Japan. Almost everything. The Clasp, oddly enough, is the one component that is actually made in continental Europe, crafted out of 18 karat rose gold in Italy. You can see it's still Grand Seiko branded and nicely finished with blasted and polish. You'll also note that it's a twin trigger release system for security. The case form is impressive. This is the 44GS case. Grand Seiko has a couple of case forms. The polyhedron 44GS that you see right here, the vintage style evocative of the 60s, and of course the 9S shape that's sort of halfway between the two. The facets are sharp. The polishing is mirrored and optically flawless. This is the tin plate Zeratsu polish of which you've heard. It's a handcraft, so this is a hand finished case. It's done by manually running the case against a tin plate milling machine. So this is manually crafted, and despite that, each micrometric facet, as you can see, truly precise and symmetrical from side to side, micrometrically. That's impressive for something done by hand, eye, and feel. Now, the case itself is Remarkably compact for a 40 millimeter watch. 46 lug to lug and 40 millimeters in diameter normally don't go together. The dial, however, is the beneficiary as it's able to open up and breathe in the 40 millimeter case. You can see the Kirazuri pattern, which I really do liken more than anything else to a galvanized steel plate. It's wonderfully detailed and no two are exactly alike. The dial furniture is sensational with diamond polished and faceted indices, as well as diamond polished and faceted Dauphine hands and counterweighted lancet seconds. The dial furniture here puts the Omega back in the case. It's all about handcraft here and precision. You'll also note that there's a power reserve indicator cut into the dial, which is an extra measure of assurance against stoppage on the wrist. And then there is a date with a quick set. You also have a hacking seconds function and the power reserve, which you can wind manually or allow to wind automatically, has a three day duration. Turn the watch over. This is Grand Seiko manufacturer caliber 9R15. The 15 and the golden medallion denoting a hot rodded 9R, which is to say instead of precision of plus or minus 15 seconds per month. This one is plus or minus 10 seconds per month, or roughly half a second per day per Grand Seiko. You can see the governing wheel. It's unidirectional. It's turned by the spring energy. There are no motors. There are no batteries. There are no capacitors in this watch. All of the motion, the motive power, is supplied by the spring. And then you have a quartz oscillator that wakes up with an induced current and governs the speed of that unidirectional wheel. When it is running slow, the back EMF is reduced and the wheel speeds up, catching up with the time. If it's running too fast, the back EMF, the electromagnetic force, forces it to slow down and keep good time. Extraordinary precision, quartz precision with mechanical soul. It is a watchmaker assembled, watchmaker tuned, and when the time comes, watchmaker serviced lifetime movement. The Omega. 
It was part of a family that bowed back in 2009 with the first generation 8500. And this is the most wearable of the Aquaterras, for guys at least, at 38.5 millimeters. You're gonna find that this is a universal case. It wears a little bit like a vintage watch and it's compact across the wrist. 45.4 millimeters and only 13.1 millimeters thick. The spacing between the lugs is 19 millimeters. So you're gonna find that this watch is an excellent match for a smaller wrist. And because I feel that Colored gold works best in discrete and traditional sizes. This one, I would venture to guess, is the more understated of the two watches. I will mention that the strap itself, let me get one last wide shot, the strap itself is very substantial. It is thicker and there's more material than you'll find in the Grand Seiko strap, which is a little bit more buttery and flexible, but less likely to wear over time because it comes broken in. This thing is as solid as a catcher's mitt. You can see it's bolstered, monotone stitch, calfskin on the underside. It's a dark brown. It's matched with a clasp that has a twin trigger release like the Grand Seiko, but you can see the double finish with the perlage and the polish. This one actually has a minder system that allows you to tuck excess length underneath so there are no minder loops that catch excess length on the strap. And excess strap length is tucked underneath the strap itself. So this is a very clean clasp design. I'm gonna call the Advantage Omega. The case, unfortunately, is as generic as they come. This has been used on virtually every Seamaster and Speedmaster since the mid-1960s. And frankly, if you're looking to set yourself apart from other Omega models, Rest assured, this is not gonna be the one to do it. You're gonna to have to get yourself something crazy like a Ploprof or vintage inspired like the 300 meter. This looks like every other Seamaster and Speedmaster. And you can see just how distinct the difference is in case form, color, and artistry. The dial puts up a fight. It's tough to compete with the Kirazuri and the dial furniture of the Grand Seiko, but Omega at least tries with its vertically striated teak deck concept that bowed in the mid-2000s. You have that striation that adds definition, then you have a step down from the center dial to a seconds and minutes track outboard. You can see that the applique indices in rose gold are tall and proud, and they have tons of loom. Uh, nevertheless, they aren't quite as handsomely finished when you loop this dial as what you'll find on the Grand Seiko. The timepiece does feature a unique time zone function that allows you to set the hour independently of the rest of the functions, and it keeps good time as you jump time zones. You can even cross the international dateline. Screw down the crown, the watch has 150 meter water resistance. It does feature hacking or stop seconds, and it features a display case back. One key refinement, other than the fact that this is a traditional Swiss lever automatic, or is it? You have 18 karat winding mass and solid 18 karat bridge. So this is the caliber 8501, the premium version reserved for the special, the special precious metal models in the Omega catalog. So these are solid, not plated. Now here's the thing, it's a coaxial escapement. It's not a Swiss lever. Tri-level tangential contact, Big time tech, George Daniels, renowned independent British watchmaker, the, the late master himself designed this system, and with the 8500 family that you see in this watch, which bowed in the Aquaterra back in 2009, you have a movement that finally realizes the precision and the long service intervals that he originally touted. Twin mainspring barrels, automatic winding, 60 hour power reserve, it is a very tough movement, and it does have some functional advantages over the Grand Seiko, specifically its ability to set the hour hand independently. Now it's a COSC certified Swiss chronometer, but plus six seconds, minus four seconds per day is not gonna cut it against a Grand Seiko rated at plus or minus 0.5 seconds per day. So let's call the advantages. And this watch does have quite a few. First, a cleaner dial. The Kirazuri and the hand finished components do show greater artistry and attention to detail. The problem is the composition of the dial is not for all, as many are gonna regard that power reserve as a gigantic wart on the face of an otherwise beautifully balanced dial. It's not for everyone. Here, the symmetry is far greater. It's more traditional in its layout. I'll also mention that the time zone feature is very useful. The watch wins on water resistance with a true screw down crown and a 150 meter rating versus a push down crown and a 100 meter rating for the Grand Seiko. I'll also mention that although both of the movements are mechanically finished, the design of the finish on the Omega is more engaging than the rather banal finish and design of the architecture and Cote de Genève, or maybe we should call them Cote de Seiko on the Grand Seiko. You'll also note that the combination of the arabesque Cote de Genève and the blackened screws, just a bit more original than the rote finishing and polished screws used on the Seiko. Also important to note, this watch has day-night legibility. The Grand Seiko doesn't feature any loom. And 
Because the rose gold on a light silver colored dial is a little bit washed out, it can be tougher to read this one by day than it is to read this one by day. So this one, as a watch used to tell time, actually has the advantage in leg legibility both day and night. I'll also mention that this watch has a mechanical heartbeat. Even with its tri-level coaxial, put it up against the ear and you'll hear it ticking like a conventional watch. A watch with a heartbeat, that's something no spring drive can ever offer. I'll also mention that the minderless clasp, which requires no loops on the strap and is very clean when closed. This clasp is just a bit more clevel, clever and clean from a functional standpoint than what you get on the Grand Seiko. Also important to mention, five-year warranty. If you can still find one of these new, it was replaced by a successor model in 2017. They're still available new. Five-year warranty for this versus three-year warranty for this. And also important to note, it's a buyer's market with many of these produced. You don't have to worry about the fact that it cost $18,200 new because you can pick them up all day long for $8,500 today. Now, the Grand Seiko, obviously rarity. With 50 pieces made from a brand that only makes 35,000 watches a year, it's both a more exclusive brand and a more exclusive model than the Omega Seamaster Aquaterra. Also, it's important to note that this watch does have superior dial quality. While we can quibble about the power reserve, there's no question that the finishing of these indices and hands, as well as the Kirazuri treatment of the dial, a combination of galvanizing and lacquer, there's no comparison. This is the luxury dial, whereas the Omega feels like a mass-produced product. And superior tech. You have spring drive, the precision of a quartz, and again, a watchmaker-assembled, lifetime serviceable, mechanically driven movement. It's the best of both worlds and it has a 72-hour power reserve versus 60 hours for the Omega. You also get the power reserve, so it's even slightly more complicated. Continuing, a distinct case form. The 44GS since 1967 has been iconic of Grand Seiko. Not only is there nothing else like it in the industry, but even in Grand Seiko's own collection, they have multiple case shapes for their watches, whereas this particular liar lug beveled case is almost universal to Omega sports watches. It's so ubiquitous that it almost inspires contempt on a watch priced new at nearly $20,000. Grand Seiko gives you both superior hand finish and a more artful and inventive and distinctive case design. Important, value retention. The market on these, at least the secondary market, has yet to develop, but most anticipate that it's probably going to trade pretty close to its original sale price of $29,500, which means it's going to retain far more value than the Omega, which trades at less than half of its original retail value. And somehow, impossibly, this is the slimmer of the two watches. So if you're going to wear one of them underneath a cuff, Unexpectedly, it's this stepped and baroque multi-level case design that comes in at 12.9 versus 13.1. That's probably the surprise of the day. You ask me which one I choose, and I tell you without hesitation, the Grand Seiko. A handmade watch, a hand-finished watch, a unique technology, and a distinctive style. This one would be my choice on every count. There's literally nothing that I prefer about the Omega. That said, neither one is a choice to be ignored or rejected. You can choose either one of these watches and wear it in good conscience, knowing you've picked a superior product relative to everything else that's out there in the industry. They're both winners, but the Grand Seiko is my choice.